thank you to my patrons for voting for this subject. If you'd like to vote on future subjects and get early access to videos, then you can from just $1 per creation. Link in the description below. The channel has hit the big time. This video is proudly sponsored by NordVPN. More about that later on. The idea of a teenager attempting to create a breedy reactor in a garden shed is equally worrying as it is impressive. The story is a case of someone who clearly was very intelligent, however not necessarily wise, as he managed to turn his mum's property into an EPA super fund site. Of course, today we are looking at David Hahn, or better known as the Atomic Boy Scout. David was born in 1976 on the 30th of October in Royal Oak, Michigan, which is about here on a map. As a toddler, his parents, Ken and Patty Hahn, divorced, meaning that David would split his time living in both parents' respective households. At an early age, he discovered an interest in science when given a book called The Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments. Several experiments required corrosive hydrochloric acid as well as some other industrial solvents. I mean, the book was from the 1960s, and health and safety was kind of non-existent back then. I've had a brief flick through a PDF of it, and I think the book is pretty cool, and very trusting in some of the things it explains. However, it was eventually pulled off the shelves for its slightly dangerous content. A lot of the timeline in this video is based off a secondary source, in the form of Harper's Magazine from November 1998. Even though it's a secondary source, the writer Ken Silverstein had interviewed directly many of the people involved in the whole Atomic Boy Scout story. I've also read the IAEA report on the cleanup, and this has formed the basis of the information I have on the environmental impact of the incident. By the age of 12, David was reading college chemistry textbooks. It seemed he had been bitten by the science bug. In his early teens, he set up a home laboratory in his bedroom at his dad's house. However, multiple number of explosions and chemical spills sent his experiments to the basement. By the age of 14, he had managed to make nitroglycerin, showing both genius as well as a flagrant disregard for safety, which would be a good indicator of things to come. The move to the basement allowed his experiments to go further unchecked, as David dived into the world of chemistry even more. Although he did well in science classes, the rest of his school career wasn't going well. However, he did manage to find jobs outside of school, mainly in retail and fast food. This was to bankroll his experiments and to fulfill his dream of owning every element in the periodic table, including and especially the radioactive ones. One particular incident would change the location of his operations once again. One evening, an explosion left David semi-conscious on the floor after he had been pounding on red phosphorus with a screwdriver. Needless to say, this got David's laboratory kicked out of his father's house. Needing somewhere to experiment, he moved his lab to his mother's garden shed. Some worrying signs were not picked up by his stepdad and mum when David wore a gas mask for some of his experiments. David was enrolled into the Boy Scouts of America in an attempt to give him direction and something to aim towards the rank of Eagle Scout. Now, to achieve Eagle Scout, you have to earn 21 merit badges. Some are compulsory, such as first aid and community badges. However, some others are up to the person to select. And of course, there was an atomic badge, which, as a side note, was sponsored by Edison Electric. So, unsurprisingly, the pamphlet was very pro-nuclear. He gained his atomic badge in May 1991, and during his studies, he had got to know the workers at a local hospital radiotherapy unit. This would be important later on. David's ultimate plan after his research was to build a breeder reactor. However, this was a rather far off ambition at this time, due to him not having any plutonium or uranium to hand, but he would try and change this. Let's have a quick overview of what a breeder reactor is. A breeder reactor creates more fissionable material than it consumes. This is great as it creates more bang for your buck when it comes to fuel. A breeder reactor uses uranium-238, which is much more abundant than the rare U-235. In theory, a breeder reactor can extract almost all the energy in the fuel. In comparison, a conventional reactor uses only around 1% of the energy available. Such a reactor essentially solved the nuclear waste question. 
However, this type of reactor fell out of favour due to being complex to operate, plus in most cases the type of coolant used is a liquid metal instead of water. This is because water would act as a moderator, slowing down the neutrons, and this type of coolant can become dangerous when exposed to moisture. The first step would be to build a neutron source and see how far he could go from there. He planned to build what he called a neutron gun, to bombard isotopes with neutrons. Easier said than done as he needed to get a hold of some radioactive material. Using the pamphlet he had gained from his atomic badge, David started contacting the people listed within, for example NRC and Edison Electric. And posing as a high school teacher, contacting the NRC proved to be very helpful in his plight for some advice on how to locate what he needed. David was put in contact with Donald Erb, Director of Isotope Production and Distribution. Erb was very helpful offering advice on how to isolate isotopes as well as providing a list of ones that would be the best to sustain a chain reaction. Well that would turn out to be a bit of a mistake. Now armed with everything he needed to know, David made a list and set out to find the materials out in the world, and surprisingly many were used in everyday items, albeit in small quantities. But that wouldn't stop Mr Hahn. Now our friend AM241, which was featured in the Atomic Man video, was one of the isotopes on David's list. And if you remember from my previous video, that AM241 is used in smoke detectors. Whilst we're on a subject, if you haven't yet, check out my Harold McCluskey video, aka The Atomic Man. Uranite contains U238 and U235 in small quantities, a naturally occurring black ore with deposits in North America. Radium-225 is found out in the wild, so to speak, on old glow in the dark clock faces and hands. The reason why they are in old style clocks and not modern ones is that the people who used to paint on the radium tended to die of cancer, and because of this it was phased out of use for less deadly glowing chemicals. I'm thinking I should cover this in a future video, let me know in the comments. Thorium can be found in certain types of gas lanterns, which again is readily available to find, especially for a boy scout. However, with all the isotopes listed, each item only contains a minute amount. For the easy to find items such as the lanterns and clocks, David accumulated these from anywhere he could, buying from antique stores and camping supply shops. Claiming it was for a report, David managed to get hold of a large amount, around 100 broken smoke detectors, at a fraction of the as new cost. Once he had collected what he thought was enough AM241, he made a ball by heating it up with a blowtorch and placed it inside a block of lead. Inside said block, he placed a tiny hole to focus the alpha rays containing protons and neutrons. David placed in front of the hole a sheet of aluminium. Aluminium absorbs alpha rays and emits a neutron. He couldn't detect that his contraption had worked with his type of Geiger counter until he introduced paraffin to measure the protons given off when hit by neutrons. This neutron gun was similar to the experiment that helped discover the neutron. He hoped to use his new neutron gun to make some fissionable radioisotopes. He set out to hunt for uranite as a source of U-235 in his car, however he didn't have much luck on that front and decided to contact a supplier to see if they would just post him some instead. After pretending to be a professor for a college to a Czechoslovakian supplier of radioisotopes, David managed to secure a few ore samples. The samples contained very small amounts of U-235 and U-238. David attempted to extract these from the ore by using some homemade sulfuric acid and a coffee filter. Needless to say, this didn't yield the intended results. Disappointed but not disheartened, David set his sights on Thorium-232 which can produce U-233 if bombarded with enough neutrons. He sourced the thorium from gas lantern mantles he had bought and burnt them into an ash using a Bunsen burner. To purify the thorium in the ash, David needed lithium. Lithium can be used to bind with the oxygen attached to the thorium dioxide, meaning the thorium would be better for David's needs. To get hold of enough lithium, he ordered around $1,000 of batteries and harvested from within by cutting them open. David filled an aluminium ball full of thorium dioxide ash and lithium, heating it with a Bunsen burner. Purifying the thorium to around 9,000 times the level found in nature. The next step 
was to bombard the Thorium-232 with neutrons to create U-233. However, his current neutron gun was nowhere near powerful enough, so David needed to make something a little more potent. Now this leads us rather neatly to the sponsor for this video, NordVPN. Now if you look up various disasters and atomic incidents like me, then a little bit of anonymity is pretty handy, especially when you're looking up how to build a neutron gun. Lead us to say, if I didn't have NordVPN, then I might be on some kind of watch list. I've used several VPNs over the past couple of years and have enjoyed the protection they afford. And I think Nord has the best user interface, making it really easy to jump from one server to another. It also allows you to surf on public Wi-Fi securely without the fear of your personal information being stolen. You can also bypass region locking for movie streaming sites, which is an annoying part of living in the UK as you miss out on so many great shows. So if you're interested, check out NordVPN by going to www.nordvpn.com slash plainly difficult to get 70% off NordVPN. This really helps out the channel, allowing me to purchase more research material as well as travel to more disaster sites in the future. Thank you for listening about our video sponsor. Let's go back to David and his souped up neutron gun. For this, David needed to get hold of a large amount of radium. Knowing that radium was present in vintage clocks, making the time easier to be read at night, David searched junkyards and antique shops, scraping off any paint he came across. Using barium sulphite sourced from the x-ray ward he had visited for his badge, David liquefied it by heating it under a Bunsen burner. The liquid was then mixed with radium and strained through a coffee filter, later dehydrating the solution into crystals, which was then stuffed into another lead block to create his neutron gun. Instead of aluminium, he managed to get his hands on a more potent neutron emitter, beryllium. He bombarded the thorium and uranium with his radium gun. However, once again, he didn't get the results he wanted. After another conversation with Herb, David realised he needed to slow the neutrons down. He could have used water, but no, that would have been too safe. Instead, tritium, a radioactive material, was chosen. Tritium, which similar to radium in that it glows in the dark, was used on gun and bow sites. Again, David set about collecting as much as he could from mail order magazines and hunting shops. The tritium was then applied to the beryllium and placed in front of the radium gun. Using the Geiger counter, David saw the radioactivity increase. This was the point that David set about trying to build his breeder reactor. However, the method was rather crude. Mixing the radioactive elements from his neutron guns, he encased them inside aluminium foil. This core was then wrapped in more foil with thorium and uranium powder. The whole arrangement was held together with duct tape. What little precaution for contamination at this point was out of the window, as at least the guns were encased in lead. Again, the creation was monitored with a Geiger counter, which again showed dangerous levels of radiation. David was worried that the pile would become uncontrollable, and decided to make his own control rods out of cobalt drill bits, but this yielded little effect. Starting to get worried, David dismantled his contraption, as there were too many radioactive items in one place. The thorium was stored in a shoebox at his mum's, the radium and americium stayed in the garden shed, and the rest was piled into the boot of his car. At 2.40am on the 31st of August 1994, David was pulled over by Clinton Township Police under suspicion of theft from a motor vehicle. The report came from residents concerned about David hanging around in the middle of the night. The excuse of I'm waiting for a friend unsurprisingly wasn't believed by the officers, and his car was searched. The contents of the boot were rightly a concern for the officers, as he had several balls of tin foil containing a mystery powder, as well as a toolbox wrapped in duct tape. Not only that, but there were fireworks, random chemicals and other partially dismantled artefacts in the boot as well. The police were extra alarmed by David's warnings that the box contained radioactive elements. Fearing that it was an atomic bomb, the car was towed to the police station to be checked out by the bomb squad. Obviously, this was a bit of a bad idea. After inspection by some rather worried bomb squad and State Department of Public Health officials, the verdict was agreed that the box was not an atomic bomb. However, the box did contain thorium, 
not contained in natural amounts. And this triggered the Federal Radiological Emergency Response Plan. The plan involved the NRC, DOE, EPA and FBI. David kept his lab secret from the police until Dave Minar, a radiological expert, interviewed David. After the two Davids spoke to one another, and on the 29th of November, a survey of the back garden lab took place. It was found that only the shed had to be condemned, and it was sealed off to contain any dangers within. However, during the intervening time between initial arrest and admittance of the lab, David's mum had thrown out much of the shed's contents into the public garbage collection. The EPA undertook its own survey in January 1995, five months after the initial vehicle search. The survey revealed a significant danger to the health of the local environment as well as the human population and petitioned the US government to set up a super fund to clean up the site. $60,000 was awarded and in June 1995 work was undertaken to safely clean the site. In total 36 sealed barrels of waste were sent for disposal at a facility in the Great Salt Lake Desert, totaling 266.4 cubic feet of debris. The waste was placed with other waste from government facilities, such as industrial, atomic weapons factories and plutonium manufacturing plants. More items had to be recovered from the police station that had initially dealt with David's arrest. These included tin foil containing thorium-223, Radium-228, parts of smoke detectors containing AM-241, chunks of lead and lanterns and clock faces. After the cleanup effort, radiation levels were measured to be back to normal levels. However, it was thought that around 40,000 people were potentially exposed to some levels of radioactive elements during the years of David's experimentation. Now, what David did achieve has been called a reactor. However, it was only really in the loosest sense, but it did create a fair bit of radiation and this means it was no less of an accomplishment. After the dismantling of his laboratory, David had lost a sense of meaning in his life. This was further compacted by the suicide of his mum in 1996. After attending Maycomb Community College for some time, David enlisted in the Navy, being posted on the nuclear-powered USS Enterprise. And after transferring to the Marines, he was honourably discharged a few years later. Unfortunately, however, David would have a run-in with the law once again. In April 2007, the FBI took an interest in David, interviewing him in regards to attempting to create a second breed of reactor. After some investigation, he was deemed not to be a threat to the public. However, this led to an arrest a couple of months later for larceny of smoke detectors. After a guilty plea, David was sentenced to 90 days in jail, suspended whilst he undertook mental health treatment. Unfortunately, the story of the Atomic Boy Scout doesn't end happily because on the 27th of September 2016, at the age of just 39, David Harm passed away from alcohol, diphenhydramine and fentanyl intoxication in his hometown in Michigan. Now thank you to my Patreons for voting for this subject and a big thank you to NordVPN for the sponsorship. Don't forget, if you'd like to get 70% off NordVPN, then go to www.nordvpn.com slash plainly difficult. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Would you like to see my videos before they are up on this channel? Then you're in luck. As for $1 per creation on Patreon, you can. Do you have any future video suggestions? Let me know in the comments. I've got a Twitter, so check me out on there. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.